Well, welcome everybody and good afternoon. It's the Tuesday, April the 30th, 2019 session in our series on entrepreneurship in Asian high-tech industries. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the U.S. Asia Technology Management Center. We're very happy to present this series, especially with support from the member companies in our industry affiliate industry affiliates program. So thanks to that support, we'll have some refreshments at the end of the session today and hope you'll stay afterward and get to meet our speaker and get to talk with each other some more. So today we have a second presentation looking at the situation in India. First we had looked at it from the standpoint of competitiveness and kind of economic theory a couple of weeks ago. Today I'm delighted that our speaker uh, is bringing to us the technical investor serial entrepreneur perspective. Uh, Dr. Ashish Gupta got his PhD in computer science at Stanford, so I'm also very happy to welcome back an alum. And uh, he is the co-founder and managing partner of Helion Ventures, which is investing in India, and it was really one of the very first domestic uh, venture capital firms to invest in that country. Uh, he uh, is a serial entrepreneur. He founded two successful companies, Tavant Technologies and also Jungli, which was acquired by Amazon, correct? And he, uh, as a lot of venture capital investors are doing now, he's on the board of a number of companies. Some of his prior investments include things like Flipkart, so maybe we should ask you to pay for the refreshments today. <laughs> and also uh, Redbus, which was a successful Indian company acquired by a Chinese company. And uh, he has been a Kaufman Fellow, which is a very prestigious kind of venture capitalist training program sponsored by the Kaufman Foundation. And um, he has authored several patents, publications, and also a book by MIT Press. So let me get out of the way and ask Dr. Gupta to give us some prepared remarks. Thank you very Thank much for coming, Ashish. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. So, um, thanks, thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. And uh, my request would be that please feel free to interrupt me at pretty much any point in time. That way it's more fun. And especially if you disagree, it is even more fun. Because a lot of this is a matter of opinion. There are some facts which we'll try and keep as close to facts as possible, despite the current trends in the world at large. But uh, the opinions, for sure, uh, are, are subject to debate. And uh, Daphne, wonderful to see you. So uh, Daphne and I were colleagues at Jungli, so it's, it's nice to see her after many years. So, so the points about me that might be relevant, I tried to do two jobs, didn't succeed, worked at IBM and, uh, and Oracle, had wonderful bosses, didn't last at either place. Uh, so I became an entrepreneur more because uh, I didn't know how to survive in a large company rather than because I had a clear point of view on what I wanted to do. And this will come in later. Uh, I've been investing in India for about 20 years. The first investment was in 1999, uh, which was as an angel. And then as an institutional investor, been investing in India since 2006. Also have had offices in India that I've started and ran since about 1998. So about 20 odd years of, uh, of exposure to India. And uh, I'm a generalist, so I've done services. Services, for those of you who don't know, are labor arbitrage companies. India has a lower cost of living. Companies like Infosys, TCS, even IBM has 100,000 people in India. So I've done several of those kinds of companies. A consumer internet, uh, Make My Trip is a OTA, like an Expedia, so to speak, and also some enterprise companies, including companies like Upwork, which does uh, a marketplace for people to develop uh, code, again, overseas. Uh, Helion started in 2006, and we've raised $600 million across three different funds. And we've invested it pretty much all. We are not raising any more money. So as an ongoing fund, uh, the fund will not uh, be making new investments. We are in the process of uh, um, garnishing whatever investments we had made. And we have about 60 companies that we have invested in over the course of the last 12 years. Um, they include Make My Trip, Azure Power, which is a solar power generation company, uh, Big Basket, which is, uh, they, delivers gro they deliver groceries um, at home. So like Instacart, except that they control the inventory also. Uh, Ola Cabs, which competes with Uber 
in India, Uber and Ola are uh, somewhat head to head or neck to neck rather, WorkSpot, which is based here. Um, and I'll get into some of more, some of these as we go on. So a little bit of history about India Venture. Most of it is uh, concurrent with some seminal events that have happened at the economic level or at the national level. So for example, the first wave of VCs, which would have been circa 95, 96, soon after liberalization happened in India. So India used to be notorious for what is known as the License Raj. And in the early 90s, one of the prime ministers came by and uh, opened up the economy a great deal. And soon after that, the first set of venture firms came around. Yes, sir. Not, not correct. OK. In the 80s, I was on the board of two of them. One was started by ICICI called TDICI. Okay. And the other one was started by Can Bank Ventures. Both existed well before 90s. Okay. But so, they were small. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my memory extends there. We have better data. And please keep jumping in. Neither of the funds, uh, actually Walden was started by a gentleman who lives here, uh, Lib Bhutan. It was even precursored by Bill Draper, yeah. who started Sutter Hill. Um, and ICICI still goes strong. It's one of the longest lasting venture firms in India by long chalk. The second set of VC firms that came about were like an echo of the dot-com boom here. Uh, like in most other parts of the world, India too said, ah, the internet is coming. Pretty much everybody from the second set is gone, except for two that I know of. And please take these as indicative numbers. It's not exhaustive. Both of whom have become extremely successful, but as private equity firms, mm -hmm. Westbridge and Chris Capital. Phenomenal track record of investing and very smart move away from venture into private equity. The third set of, or the third coming, so to speak, which has resulted in the more stable ecosystem that we see today was on the back of the credibility of China having become a destination where a lot of people raised money. And a lot of people made money. And this was part of the wave that I also participated in. In fact, the fundraising experience was very interesting, where I had been pretty much thrown out of every limited partner's office. Limited partners are people who invest in VCs, till press articles started talking about India being the next China. And within a matter of two months, uh, we had successfully raised $140 million, which, of course, causes serious introspection, because it was clearly not me that was getting funded. It was uh, the person who wrote the Wall Street Journal article that was really momentous or important for the funding event. But that was the third coming of the Indian venture scene. And this is where the bulk of the firms that got created have not only survived, but uh, several of them are thriving. So there were largely three kinds of firms that got started. One was foreign VCs, because everybody was kind of touching and feeling and figuring out, should we do this, should we not do this? So a bunch of people were flying in and out. That included people like Battery, Columbia, Foundation, Kleiner Perkins. All the people who are flying in and out have stopped. Those that committed to put feet on the street have survived. And they include people like Axel, Lightspeed, Matrix. These all have not only well-established presence here in the Valley, but they also have well-established presence in India. And the third genre was the ones that, uh, I beg your pardon, that was the, the foreign folks. The second were the corporate folks, which today include uh, Ant is Alibaba's uh, financial services arm, Google, Intel, uh, Qualcomm, InfoEdge is an Indian company, uh, Tencent. So between US majors and China companies, pretty much all corporate venture capital in India is accounted for. And then there are domestic firms. These are people who only have presence in India, of which we are one. And there are others, Kalari, Nexus, Safe. And I'm sure I've omitted several names, so no offense is intended, of course. Quick yes, sir. Are there any domestic corporate funds? Uh, InfoEdge is one of those. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes. There are also people like Wipro, but they are more run out of the family office rather than the corporation. And I'm sure there will be others that I'm missing. But the point being that you can count them on one hand, uh, even if I've missed four. Uh, it's not like 40 that I'm missing. Yes, please. You also go maybe later deep into why that happens, like why the client, client companies did not survive. Oh, sure. Actually, we'll discuss it right away. So the question was, why did the people who were flying in and out, why did that not sustain? which is, by the way, an excellent point, because it repeats itself in every geography. It showed up in Israel. It showed up in the UK, and so on and so forth. 
One is in the beginning, consider it a scouting mission, where people, instead of actually hiring somebody, are investing the energy to figure out, is this worth doing or not? So some people separated out in that way. Another set of people did not make it because of the 2008 bust, where the firms that were flying in and out, those that were not very strong were told by their investors that they need to first mind their core business at home, as opposed to get distracted by this new shiny thing uh, 10,000 miles away. The same investors were encouraging people to try out this new shiny thing two years ago. Uh, but when hard times come, then everybody hunkers down and figures out what is my core knitting and stick to it. So 2008 was the seminal point where a lot of the flying folks uh, were shut out of the market because they had to choose where they were investing dollars. Okay. Um, continuing on the timeline, when I moved to India in 2006, everybody believed that the internet is just around the corner, or the adoption of the internet, I beg your pardon, the internet was very much there. Large adoption of the internet was just around the corner. Uh, many a year was spent wringing our hands, uh, waiting for users to grow, but nothing would happen. What changed the scene was the iPhone. As soon as the smartphone arrived, while the iPhone did not come to India, a whole bunch of cheaper knockoffs did actually motivate the telcos to start meaningfully invest in data services. So 2009, 2010 was watershed in terms of the number of internet users that really took off. Now Flipkart, for example, saw traction then, as did a whole bunch of other companies uh, in that era. So that was one very interesting uh, event from the perspective of the growth. Um, Professor Dasher was asking me, when do these venture funds raise money from foreign investors, or are there domestic investors? That trend started in about 2012 odd. And please treat these numbers as, as indicative. The Indian corporations started putting, putting money into venture funds, as did some pools of capital that traditionally stay away. Uh, so for example, retirement funds are a big contributor to venture capital in the US. In India, there are very few retirement funds. By and large, the maturity of what kinds of asset classes people invest in is much earlier in India than it is here. And it takes time for people who manage retirement funds in particular to be told that go take this risk. Otherwise, they are told to be a lot more conservative with their capital. That movement has started now for the last six to seven years. But the bulk of the capital comes from people like Stanford, Harvard, the not-for-profit foundations, wealthy individuals who pool capital together and invest in venture funds, that would probably account for, and this is a guess, more than 95% of the capital that is invested in the venture industry in India. And 2018 saw another event, which is Reliance launched a service called Geo, where they are pretty much giving away broadband. Let's see how the pricing changes over time. And that has completely redone the face of the internet user uh, in India. And the most primary user of that is everybody stands around in a corner and watches useless videos. And what are the sociological impacts of all of that? We'll discuss some another time. What can be told in very clear terms is the amount of content consumption in India right now is just insane. One interesting factoid, WhatsApp discovered that every morning at the time, India morning, just the good morning messages that went from one person to another person accompanied by a video of them drinking tea or coffee or whatever the hell they were doing accounted for double digit percentages of traffic of WhatsApp every day like clockwork between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. India time. So it's that wacky that you have double digit percentages of traffic overwhelmed by and mostly junk. And that number is, is continuing to rise. And that raises very interesting questions, which we'll discuss vernacular content plays and things like that, uh, and how does that play out over time. OK, shall we move on? Uh, some characteristics of the India market. One, it's open. And I'm contrasting that, in particular, with a nod to China, which chose to take a closed market approach. And this debate still goes on in India. And I'll tell you why it is still a debate. And it's not a clear answer as to which is a better, a better answer. Several people who I knew who were fans of the open market approach are today talking about why we might be better served to actually close it down, uh, or at least throttle it some, and everything in between. So it's an open market. Uh, English, thanks to the British, is reasonably 
widespread. Not everybody speaks English. But the net penetrates India slower than English penetrates India. So it's an interesting question as to whether vernacular will ever be an interesting area. But especially when you look at where the dollars are, it is directly correlated to English skills. So for anybody who's looking at things from an economic perspective, most of the popular websites in India do not even have a local language rendition. They are practically entirely English. And please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think Flipkart has a local version, neither does Make My Trip. And they do now? OK, thank you. But also like regional languages. Got it. And how old would that be? So you're right. It's like largely recent. Okay. Two to three years. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much. So um, as the net is penetrating, you'll find more of this language happen. So English is uh, is very popular, and there is serious connection to the U.S. Evidenced by people like myself, and there are what at least four or five million expats uh, in India uh, in the U.S. I beg your pardon. And because several of them come from the tech industry, that is where between healthcare and tech that defines most of the Indian expats, a lot of the US products found their use in India very quickly, especially those that had viral components. Hotmail, for example, which some of you might not remember, uh, it is today Microsoft's uh, open email offering uh, bought in 1998 uh, from here. Hotmail's largest set of email IDs have always been from India. And that was one of their mainstays for both the absence of a business model and presence of large amounts of traffic. So this spread from the US is what defines or explains why Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and of that, Facebook and Google first are the dominant equivalent platforms in India also. There is no room for anybody else. The few people who have tried have all kind of figured out relatively quickly that this is not a game they can play. Amazon and Netflix, of course, is a different game. It's a very conscious execution game as opposed to uh, a viral propagation of stuff. So they fall in a different category. But yet, Fang is the dominant player for these uh, classes of businesses in India also. This is one of the reasons why this debate shows up as to whether or not one should start closing off certain parts. Yes, sir. Yes. Between Netflix and Amazon, all paid video is currently taken care of. Small in terms of revenue when you compare it to these two guys. And then you look at how the spread is, the rate of growth, uh, it's even more scary. Uh, especially Amazon uh, is continuing to do what it does, which is cross-subsidize. Uh, right. Um, cloud infra is dominated by US companies. In fact, we wonder sometimes jokingly whether uh, the Indian Army's machine learning models, whatever they are, can be shut down by convincing uh, Amazon to turn off its service uh, for an hour or two. There is not a locally run data center plus software infrastructure on top of it where you can reliably run, do machine learning, for example. Uh, among several other things. There are local uh, rack space equivalent companies, but they're very much that. They're hosting players. They are not full stack infrastructure players. And that space is also dominated by Indian companies. And now Alibaba has started a fairly serious push to get its software stack run inside of an Indian company. Uh, Paytm is that company to try and offer, quote unquote, a native cloud infrastructure stack. But it is far from native. Uh, so that is another very interesting thing to just park in the back of your head as one looks at opportunities. Why are some of these things happening? Because capital and technology is significantly stronger than geographic boundaries. Amazon spends multiple billion dollars per annum in subsidizing the customer acquisition and sales in India. And technology stacks, once you build them, if you look at the stack at the scale of what Facebook operates, or Google operates, are very, very hard to replicate unless you invest large amounts of money and a lot of time in doing that. These are two things that have really helped the technology intensive or capital intensive businesses to continue to dominate in India also. The enterprises on the other hand, so this is mostly consumer facing, uh, other than the cloud infra stuff, which is both consumer and enterprise facing. 
If you look at enterprises themselves, what are the equivalents of the Procter & Gamble, the General Electric, the power utility companies here? These are buyers of IT. If you look at the buyers of IT in India, they spend a much smaller percentage of their overall budget on IT. They're early to this game. So when one of their CIOs goes out and makes a buying decision, she or he is much better equipped and much better served by saying, I'm buying IBM, proverbial IBM. Nobody buys IBM. But, <laughs> uh, so you find Salesforce, SAP. SAP does, I think, a billion dollars of revenue in India. Oracle, they all sell very effectively in the Indian enterprise. Startups, on the other hand, have a terrible time selling to Indian enterprises, both because of this conservatism and also because when you are early in the technology adoption cycle, you don't want innovation. You first want efficiency and automation, which comes from off-the-shelf solutions, or if your problem is not being solved by an off-the-shelf solution, of which we are beginning to some, see some things. HR, for example, or taxation. The rules are different enough that you don't end up using a US solution. Therefore, there are homegrown solutions that are getting traction. But in places that can be transplanted, the enterprises choose to buy uh, US software. And that also will change over time. Local companies are more successful in categories that are either regulated or that have physical touch. So you look at telecom. You look at fintech. By the way, financial technology in India, uh, coming to the US makes one feel like one has gone back to the Stone Ages. Uh, we are busy writing checks to each other. If I want to transfer money to somebody else from a bank account, it's not possible. Uh, so financial technologies and actually a whole bunch of stuff in the telecom stack also, things are significantly further ahead because one started late and therefore one has built much better systems in place than, for example, a place like the US. In those kinds of categories and now increasingly in full stack plays, full stack meaning Instead of selling something to, so let's take lending here. For those of you who are familiar with a lending club or a cabbage, they're saying, instead of trying to sell a solution to a bank, I will both become a pseudo bank, I will lend, I will do risk assessment, I will basically solve the whole problem. A number of companies like this in India are doing extremely well in logistics, in financial technologies, in food, and that instead of teaching an old dog a new trick, you basically become the dog and the trick and the ringmaster, the whole shooting match. And that also is useful in another way. In a market where there isn't that much money to take, you take all the margins uh, from the top to the bottom, and that makes the business a lot more viable. Okay. So a bunch of companies in that space. Vernacular, as I mentioned, growing quickly. And as the gentleman there mentioned, it's penetrating uh, what was otherwise English also. The money behind vernacular is still an open question because that is typically associated with folks who do not have as much spending power or who are not as familiar with technology to spend that money even though they have the power. And it's a combination of those two things. But that, again, is a matter of time. One other dynamic is that cost of building technology is significantly lower there than it is here. I don't know how many of you hire people here and those of you who are going to be in the job market with the tech industry, my congratulations. It's impossible to hire people here without paying starting salaries of north of $100,000. And if, by any chance, you have deep learning on your resume, uh, we start with a quarter million dollars, independent of whether or not you know how to spell it. So it is just, it's very, very hard to build a lot of these companies here if you need serious technology. That cost in India goes anywhere from a tenth to a third. And it's not all a bed of roses, and we'll talk about that also. But a number of enterprise software companies are coming out exactly because of that dynamic. If you can iterate a version of a product with half a million dollars as opposed to five, it gives you multiple shots at goal. And therefore, you can take both raise smaller amounts of capital, take it longer, and avoid dying if you get it wrong and you've blown all the cash that you had. Um, all of those dynamics play in favor of these enterprise software companies. Okay. So kind of broken up the market into a two by two, uh, despite not having an MBA. Um, so there is one, the, the columns are, are you going after the India market, or are you going after the foreign market? 
And the foreign market, I'm predominantly using the US as a proxy. The US accounts for 30, 40% of every kind of spend in the world. So using that as a proxy. And along the rows, the first several rows above the yellow line are consumer slash full stack companies, and below that is enterprise. Okay? So there are two quadrants that are pretty much empty. There are very few, if any, consumer companies that are going after foreign markets out of India. So the consumer companies are all looking at the India market, which also makes sense. You understand the consumer. It's much more local. Uh, the nature of the beast is very different, changes very quickly. So if you're local, you can actually relate to the consumer and move much faster. The domestic enterprise market is also pretty much non-existent. It's dominated by, oh, so by the way, the stuff in blue, italics, and underlined is a foreign company. The stuff in black is an India company, uh, born in India. So the enterprise market locally is either dominated by foreign companies, SAP, Amazon, Microsoft, Oracle, but there is very little local activity. So we'll spend our time in these other two quadrants where there is more to talk about. Consumer media, as we discussed, is dominated pretty much entirely by foreign companies. There are now some local vernacular plays, share chat, stuff like that. But even there, uh, Chinese companies have very serious presence. Food, which is, again, high touch, is uh, two large companies, uh, Zomato and Swiggy. And it's a very interesting sector, because there are lots of double income, um, no kids, extremely hard to drive from home to work. So you get the infrastructure issues are a recurring theme as we go through this. Uh, traffic is, if you think 101 is bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. You got to go hang out in Bangalore and Mumbai, and you will be glad to drive on 101. So when you combine working hours with logistics, things like food and other convenience which is delivered at home becomes a very interesting space. So food has grown like a weed. The unit economics, by the way, uh, we'll park for a moment. We'll discuss that as a standalone um, category for those of you who are thinking about India. Retail, we know of Flipkart and Amazon. Flipkart is now owned by Walmart. Um, again, all discount driven. By the way, the unit economics for pretty much every consumer facing business in India make no sense. They lose money, <laughs> and this is practically every business. The exceptions can be counted. Uh, the rule is they lose money at a transaction level. I'm not talking marketing, cost of customer acquisition. I'm talking about here is a box. Somebody will touch it to ship it out. Somebody will carry it. The cost of fuel, the cost of the box, the cost of the goods versus the money that you get paid. You lose money. We are not talking about the advertising yet. That, of course, you lose money. But at transaction level, all of them lose money. And that is true for food, retail. Both Amazon, Flipkart is true for Uber and Ola. Uh, on every right, they lose money. So that's a recurring theme for practically every consumer business. Yeah. In the spirit of being a hardcore India patriot, mm -hmm. the one thing that you mentioned on the top right uh, bucket, which is hard to serve from India, I think there are some changes that we're seeing in the last two years, which are also growing very fast. The jury is still out there. Will that succeed or not? But things like Ola entering the London market, Ola entering Australia, New Zealand, Paytm entering Canada, Japan, yeah. and the one that you don't have up there is uh, Oyo, which is the $5 billion hospital unicorn which has entered China, China. Uh, China. and is growing. It's almost equal to the Indian business. Yeah. Thank you. So I actually do believe that even consumer media plays will come out of India, and we can talk about that later. So I've personally started funding a few. So uh, the future. I think is a very different ball game, but point very well taken. Thank you. And for those of you who could not hear the gentleman, he was saying that there are examples of several companies, like Ola, which is a car ride company, has gone overseas. There is a hospitality company, which has managed hotels, that has gone overseas, um, and a payment company also. Yes, sir. Yeah, my question is that like, if these companies are not making money, their quantities are increasing, margins are decreasing, and as you said, at the transaction level, they're losing money. And like, of what, like, I'm just a freshman, I'm just thinking aloud here, yeah. that at this point of time, like, is it, like, for example, I read an article that said that Amazon is going, like, the Indian market is like a winner takes all. Like, in this competition between Amazon and Flipkart, in the end, whoever has more amount of capital to burn, and whoever, and whoever runs out of capital first is going to lose, and the other one takes the whole market. But in a sense, aren't we setting up the Indian market, the expectations too high, and like, 
Will the will the will the will the market even use those kind of products when the prices increase? Like for example, I'm like just an example. Flipkart runs out of cap. Walmart runs out of capital. And like Amazon is is like the largest player. So aren't we setting up the expectations too high for the market? Expectations of the consumer yes. or the of investors the or uh, of the consumer. So the consumer will eventually have to pay the price of the product that is being given. Right now, and this is meant in jest. It is a large amount of wealth movement from the wealthy in the US, Europe, and Asia to the consumer in India via the VCs. That is one way of looking at uh, normalization of standards of living uh, process that is going on. So yes, it will reverse uh, at some point in time. The bet that most of these companies are making is that behavior will change so that it will make it irreversible. And even though you might find that some set of people will step back, the vast majority of people begin to pay for convenience. So a couple of interesting factoids. In China, there used to be rampant piracy of content. Once the per capita income went above a certain <coughs> threshold, people started valuing the convenience of not having to do all the tours and so on and so forth to get around this nuisance of. So China saw the levels of content piracy literally fall off a cliff, very, very commensurate with the increase of a per capita number beyond a certain, and, and an economist had explained to me why that number in, of course, hindsight, made a lot of sense. So there is a fair bit of speculation on at least two counts. One is that as the GDP keeps going up and per capita income going up, uh, people pay more for convenience than they would otherwise because the cost of convenience becomes acceptable uh, given disposable income. That is one. And the second is some behaviors become irreversible. So for example, if you look at Ola, or Uber, the ride-sharing stuff, I think that behavior is irreversible. If tomorrow these companies start running the business on profit, at least I would bet, and this is an opinion, will the business shrink? The answer is yes. Will it still be meaningfully large? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Because it is a behavior that has led to several people that I know getting rid of their cars. And these are people who can afford a driver. So we are not talking of somebody who's just not interested in driving themselves, largely because when you balance off both cost of capital and you balance off convenience, you're better off. Parking is a nuisance. Where do you put that car, even if you have it when you reach somebody's home? So several of these will fall in. And that is the bet that, by the way, most of these people are making. Okay. When do you see this bet? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> if I do that, I'm be working. Okay. <laughs> so, um, there seem to be no product companies over here. It's all cash flow companies. And when you say product, what do you mean? So would Netflix be a product? No, Netflix is uh, entertainment. This is, I would consider it, it provides you a service. Right. Yeah, it's not something you can hold, you can buy, put on your computer. So give me an example of a product. And, so, and the reason I'm asking is because that is a very profound question that you raise, which, is, which causes consternation not only in, in this context, but let's use a couple of examples and, uh, and see if we can find companies like that. Yeah, I make a medical device. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, uh, a car, stuff like that. Okay. Would Elon Musk exist in Okay, India? wonderful question. That is, uh, so thank you. And it is a more reflection of my bias, and it is an act of omission. So. Uh, they are there, and I will quickly talk to it. And I just neglected to put them here because I didn't think about it. So, mia kalpa. Yeah, because the intellectual property, the IP, the patents, uh, okay, tied more to the product type of company. That I will beg to differ with you. Uh, and let's address first your first question, which definitely is worth addressing. And then let's talk about the IP stuff maybe uh, outside, because that is a more interesting uh, debate. So, there are a whole bunch of companies that are doing medical devices, <clears throat> there are a number of EV companies. There are at least, I beg your pardon, I can think of at least six companies that are doing scooters or electric vehicles or variations thereof, and several of them are doing well. There is a very interesting robotics company called Gray Orange, which has started building warehouse robotics for managing e-commerce warehouses and stuff. And they are also seriously doing very well. So there are a number of those companies. and. Because I don't invest in those areas, I completely forgot about it. My apologies. <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to give you more data about it if you're interested. Drop me a note, 
and I'll compile some of that and get it together to you. But there is a number of amount there. The healthcare stuff in particular is very interesting because there is no FDA scrutiny at the level at which you see in this country. You have the ability to actually iterate and produce products at a much faster pace. Now, the folks who are very staunch defendants of the FDA will make an argument that, does that mean we will treat other human beings at a guinea pig level? There is a spectrum of this. There are well-intentioned people who will not uh, abuse that privilege, just as there are well-equipped people here who abuse the privilege despite the FDA, because you can work around FDA. Uh, you'll be amazed at the statistics that the FDA uses to say yes or no. For example, you can have 99 failures, but the two successes are what are counted uh, for getting an approval. So anybody who believes that that is a very interesting conservative system has another thought coming. Uh, but there is a whole bunch of stuff happening in medical devices because the opportunity to take product to market uh, is significantly larger. The number of served people is significantly lower. And the barrier to entry is significantly lower also. Okay. So good point. Yes, Rakesh. I'm just curious. You know, there's this company called Heroes now. Would that have <coughs> fit in this consumer media? I'm just trying to get your definition. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Trying to essentially send the Bollywood content to all the Middle East and even yeah. Western Americans in US. I, I would agree. So I don't think we should treat these as hard boundaries, especially when we start looking at Southeast Asia and the Middle East. There, there is a lot of back and forth also. Numbers are not yet meaningful, uh, though, because, uh, but again, point will take. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, we will stop whenever 40 minutes are done. Uh, so uh, it's not necessary to go through this as long as we are chatting. Yeah. Yeah. When extending the same line of thought, uh, what's in it for a VC then? If it, at, at okay. we have enough data now that um, uh, I would call them service companies in some ways. There are either marketplaces, listings, <coughs> etc. But they're effectively a version of offline services in digital format, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what's in it for a VC? What are you betting against? Uh, uh, so there is, uh, so let's, let's jump a couple of slides. <laughs> so this is the exit picture. And this is going to be impossibly hard to read, my apologies. Uh, this is courtesy of Bain and Company, because they had collated the data, so I just cut and paste. And uh, I, the report is available publicly. Um, if you look for Bain and IVC, IVC is the Indian Venture Capital Association, you will find this report. And it has a lot more data with a lot more intelligent commentary than what you'll get from me. Uh, so this is the exit picture. <coughs> what it says is that in 2014, there was $1.3 billion of exit. That grew to $2.3 billion in 2015. That came down to $1.4 in 2016. Went up to about four in 2017 and then jumped to 20 in 2018. So 20 was an outlier. That was when Walmart bought Flipkart. So if we look at even remove that, by the way, this is a business of outliers. So throwing outliers will leave you with a useless graph in this exercise. But for a moment, let's remove a Flipkart. We can see that the exits have kind of gone from very little numbers to at least repeatably 2 to 3 to $4 billion per annum. If you also overlay one other factor on top of this, which is that the venture business is about 2006, so about 13 years old, it takes eight to 10 years for companies to get to a place where they become interesting. In conjunction, it's a small market by definition, which is growing large. So if you look at the dollar sizes, India is a $2 trillion GDP, give or take. The US is what, 18 or 14? 18? Yeah, my recollection was 18, somewhere 14 to 18. So somewhere between seven to nine times larger. <clears throat> and when you overlay disposable income on top, on top of it, the opportunity to create value is very seriously tied to disposable income. Otherwise, the bulk of your money will get spent in just surviving. So that equation becomes even more skewed. What the VCs, including people like myself, are betting on, already if you see the, the this is an interesting curve that within 12 years of the creation of an industry, the venture industry in the US is at least 50 years old. Uh, Sutter Hill was started in 1967, and it wasn't even the first venture firm. So we are in an era where things move much faster. We are early in that game. There are 1.2 billion people in the country and growing. 
So there are only one of two outcomes. Either the country explodes or implodes, or it makes progress. There is nothing else in the, in the middle, uh, in my view, because you can't open up a Pandora's box, show people wonderful advertising, tell them you deserve to have a, a Rolex watch and a good pair of shoes, and then tell them, no, sorry, bad luck. And they will either kill each other, or they will figure out a way out to get out of this. So either you have to be an optimist or a pessimist. There is no sitting on the fence as far as this particular equation is concerned, in my view. So you have a whole bunch of people betting on the fact that maybe a long-lasting civil war is not uh, the, the most likely scenario, and therefore this will grow. The amount of money that is being deployed is not that large, which is one of the other things to keep in mind. So this is the amount of money that is being raised. VC industry, OK. So this is what has been invested in India. This is only venture, by the way. This doesn't cover late stage. The 2016 number is 3 billion, which came down to 1 billion in 17. And in 18, it's about 2.3 billion. So if you're putting in steady state, you're putting in two or three, you're beginning to get two or three out, which correspond to when the numbers are much smaller, looks like something is working. Does that um, help? I guess what I'm trying to ask is, when you were investing in a company, what, are you, what is the metric you're looking at when you already know that it's a loss making? Uh, so thank you. What are the key metrics you, you think of? Sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you were asking it. So what are some of the things that one looks for? So in most consumer companies, one ends up looking for engagement. And do people come back time and time again? So after you've got them once, will they keep using your product? Because if they're engaged, then you will figure out. Is a new name for eyeballs? No. Because engagement is the next level metric of eyeballs. Eyeballs is counting how many people have come without paying attention to whether or not they are actually doing something on your site. You're not counting transactions. Engagement doesn't mean transactions. Engagement is somewhere in between. At the same time, it doesn't mean eyeballs. That is a little too simplistic. And we can spend many hours around this because it is a well-defended uh, and it can be backed up by data. So it's not just an opinion. Examples of engagement would be when Facebook was not monetizing. People were still coming and spending endless hours doing useless stuff, which was, my, my uh, apologies, but that is my view. It was clear that if they're going to spend two hours, you will always be able to pick their pocket for a few cents at some point in time. So if you have engagement, now do you force engagement? Do you buy engagement? Do I give you a $5 coupon every time to come here and do something? There are shades in between also. So for example, discounting in e-commerce begins to look like eyeballs, not engagement. If people are coming of their own volition and they're not being incented on the next transition, you be, not, next transaction, you begin to move down the path of engagement. So that is one metric that people measure. Growth is another one, which everybody loves, with or without its nuances. That is the wonderful trick, uh, how to raise money. Burn some capital for three months, uh, show inordinate growth, and somebody will come along. So that is another metric which a lot of people look for, significantly more nuanced uh, than engagement. So Ashish, yes, you're sir. talking about growth in the capital value of the company, not, uh, not in necessarily of growth in sales. Sorry, growth in number of users. Thank you very much. Number of good, users, good thank you. Uh, which then will translate to growth in the, in the valuation is what one hopes for. Which is a big mystery anyway. Which is a mystery, absolutely. And then you look for, from a VC perspective, how do you get out of this at some point in time? Which for a lot of companies in India is an open question. Because the Indian capital markets. Which is where your graph I thought was significant because it showed all strategic exits. G, absolutely. Uh, sorry, G, yes. Uh, if one goes back to the graph that he's referring to, the bulk of the money in India has been made by either investors selling to other investors, which you can argue is the greater fool theory, or Walmart, which can also be argued as a greater food theory. But uh, and nevertheless, um, the bulk of the exits are early stage investors selling to later stage investors. There are now the beginnings of companies that are more companies that are going public. But that still is not a very large number of companies that, are, that can be digested by the public markets. And that is also a challenge with the size of the public markets themselves. So for example, our fund has taken three companies public on the NASDAQ, as opposed to the Indian Stock Exchange. Largely because 
if you have a billion dollar company and you don't have enough liquidity in that market, you can't get out of that company. So on the NASDAQ, a billion dollar company doesn't even, there you have to worry about whether somebody will cover you. So it's a different problem. But liquidity is not a problem. In the Indian market, liquidity is a problem. Uh, so going public is not a very popular way of, going, uh, of getting out. Okay. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, the Indian market is growth seen um, on a global scale. Like for US companies, growth means getting outside of the US, international right. expansion. Is it too premature for Indian companies right now to be thinking of expansion internationally, or right now they're just looking to dominate in the Indian market? So um, I don't have enough data, so I will give you a few sample points and tie and stitch something together real time. And please jump in. As the gentleman there was pointing out, there are several Indian companies that have started venturing out, in my view, too early. And part of it. It depends upon who's selling and how you're selling. So it's still marginal. So overseas activity is still relatively marginal. It depends on whether you count investment, whether you count top line, or whether you count number of users. They all vary radically. Because a user in an overseas market is often worth 10 times the user in the domestic market. So when you look at yield per user for several of these companies, like for example, two of our companies sell in Southeast Asia. One sells payment solutions, the other sells gifting cards. For one customer, we literally get 10 times the money that we get in India. So one driver for these overseas market are companies that are looking to say, OK, I got all my systems in place. Now I need to monetize all of this. In terms of whether or not the investors value them, I think it varies radically. The thing that people do look for is a dominant position in the India market. If you don't have a dominant position there, then please don't start wandering around, because then it is more like running away from a problem rather than having conquered this and therefore expanding your horizons, if I'm making sense. Uh, so that is at least a cursory dynamic that, that I would point to. Yeah. Uh, quick one. Uh, what is the comment on B2B space, which is going sure. on? So B2B uh, and uh, Dr. Dash, just tell us when we are out of time or uh, we will pack up accordingly. I do want you to be able to get through what you're trying to get through. Um, th there but was... <laughs> this is a good discussion. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, if you would. So in the enterprise space, I won't touch upon the services space because that I think most of you are probably aware of the fact that that business has been going on for uh, Infosys started in 83. So at least 36 years for that one company and a whole bunch of others. And that trend continues with new forms of companies. So let's just deal with uh, B2B software companies. So there are now a few companies that are in the, maybe three or four companies that are in the $100 million revenue number. In India, serving the global market with a honest to goodness enterprise class software product. Freshworks is one which competes with Salesforce. Uh, I'm told Dhruva has gotten to those kinds of numbers. And there are a couple of others whose name I'm blanking out on. Still small numbers, but the whole B2B business is maybe six or seven years old. And the reason why it ended up starting out is because there is a fair bit of technical talent. The folks who are not equipped to do consumer companies begin to ask, hey, I want to do a startup also. And if the domestic market is not interesting, why don't I go to the overseas market? There is already a history of selling, albeit services. So there are enough salespeople who have relationships in these companies to at least get you going. And then you figure out the rhythm of selling products as different from rhythm of selling services. They are two very distinct motions. Uh, and that was the genesis. And the other point that I mentioned very early on is the cost advantage. You can build an enterprise class service company. For example, one of the companies that I'm on the board of We've spent $4 million to date, and we have $6 million of recurring annual revenue. It's nearly impossible to get that kind of number. And by the way, this is not every company. Uh, I'm calling it out because it's an exception. So I have several other dogs also, which we can talk about how much money has gone in and nothing has come out. Uh, but this is doable. This is not doable for all practical purposes in the Valley. And this is not the only company. I can give you 10 examples of companies in India that have reached 10 million ARR bootstrapped or a couple of million dollars in. Because you can get technical talent in some of those cases. 
So I think it is a very interesting growing uh, space. Uh, big question there is, can you sell effectively sitting in India? The interesting huge change that at least I'm seeing is six, seven years ago, you could sell maybe a $5,000 product over the phone. And that too in very specific areas. You could sell tech support. You could not sell HR because the buyer was not used to buying from a Indian sounding voice over the phone. Today, I know several companies that close $100,000 to $150,000 deals only on the phone across a much larger set of sectors. This is not because somehow India has turned the tide. This is because fundamentally enterprise buying is moving to inside sales across the board. India just happens to be the lucky beneficiary of this trend, as will companies from Southeast Asia or any other non-US geography. Even companies here um, are not traveling to sell. They do inside sales, a video conference to demonstrate the product, and the buyer is getting more and more comfortable across more and more segments. Now, I think a million dollar sale will be hard to close. You want to meet people. But the fact that it has gone from 5K to 150K in a matter of five years, repeatably, is something to, to take note of, which comes to your point. Yeah, so I was uh, more referring to companies like Oran or Delivery. Those are the people who are getting Domestic so B2B. Domestic, yeah. So I don't have a very optimistic point of view on, on those kinds of businesses, unless they're full stack. Selling software, I think, is not a game that is going to play out in India in the near future, in my view. Full stack, absolutely. Logistics, Rivigo, Blackbuck are doing extremely well. They're selling to businesses, but I'm putting them in the full stack category. Okay. So maybe it would be good if you continue <coughs> with your presentation. And okay. Then let's do Q&A at the end, because okay. we're really getting into kind of a general conversation at this point. Okay. So what are some of the implications? The government is involved in regulations, both some that you can criticize, some that you have to applaud. For example, data protection. Uh, a lot of leaves are being taken out of the GDPR book. Some of the concerns are around the fact that if you have, and forgive my use of the word, near monopolistic businesses, and I would put Google, Amazon in that category at this point in time, control all your consumer data, how do you guard against not only the threat that comes out of a company, but that comes out of a foreign company. There are move data to kinds of initiatives that there must be a copy of the data within the geographic boundaries of India. It can't be sitting all in a data center in Oregon. So there are mandatory rules that are being passed around this that people are adjusting. Now keep in mind, most digital laws, even in the US, are either evolving or need to evolve further. India is further behind the curve on all of those. And therefore, the fact that these regulations are getting refined should not be a surprise. One is learning at the level of policy making and then evolving. Indian policy making is a lot more spaghetti-ish than well thought through policy making. So that comes with its own can of worms, uh, but it continues to evolve uh, as these plays uh, go further. Local payment networks. So Visa and MasterCard, for example, are today lobbying India through the US government because India now has a domestic payment network which replaces Visa or MasterCard, which charges one-tenth of the merchant discount rate. So what Visa and MasterCard would give you for a percent 25, a percent 50, gets done at 0.15%. And that is largely as a way to move uh, payments digitally, which I'm a big fan of stuff like that. Uh, but then somebody else has to pay the price, in this case, Visa and MasterCard. Um, Amazon has been prevented from doing private label. And I'm just giving you examples, by the way, because I found these interesting. So if you, I don't know if you know, which is the largest battery manufacturer and supplier in this country? Any guess in the US? Duracell. Duracell. Any other guesses? Tesla. It's Amazon. Both in terms of wattage and in terms of number of batteries produced. So Amazon Basic is bigger than Duracell, not even by basis points. And that is turning out to be the case in cables. It's turning out to be the case in several other sectors. So 
if you have all the data of who's buying what, at what price, where, it makes sense that, and the boundaries that in traditional retail, private label would be 30% of what you sell. Why? Because people come to your store, so if you become 100% of what you sell, they don't like your store. You become Gap as opposed to Macy's. So in the physical world, there was a natural boundary to how far private label could go. In the virtual world, there is no boundary to how far private label can go. So Amazon is wiping out the battery business in the US. The Indian government has taken steps to say no e-tailer will both sell their own products and own the store. And there are variations of this. And by the way, this is a lot more nuanced. So please don't confuse this as me being a vehement supporter of all regulations. There are some pretty screwed up ones also. But the bottom line is this, uh, this uh, whole process is evolving. There are some very interesting initiatives. For example, there are open APIs to get a lot of government data. So there are interesting companies being built around data aggregation of that. FinTech space, as I mentioned to you already. Immigration policies here are actually helping India. I go regularly to recruit people from colleges. The number of people who are willing to now apply for an advanced degree through a combination of both more domestic opportunities and the fear that they will be replaced, refused a visa is now down in the single digit percentages. And I'm talking about the IITs at this point in time. Uh, I came here 30 years ago, 80% of the class came here. Uh, at this point in time, uh, IIT Kanpur CS, three people came out of a class of 70. So uh, I think it is good for the country. I don't think it is that good for, for us here. And I go between both places, so I'm totally muddled. Uh, it's a growth pet that we discussed, not present market size. And the ecosystem dynamics that you see here are present there also. While we are in a virtual world, physical proximity works, and Bangalore is becoming the stronger and stronger player. It used to be 33, 33, 33 in favor of Bangalore, Delhi, Mumbai. Today, Bangalore is easily 50% of everything that gets done in the startup space in India. And that feedback loop is very powerful. Talent, money, support, advisors, they all feed into each other. Some components, I'll, rush, I'll run through this quickly. Talent, we've talked about, one and a half million new engineers graduate every year. On the downside, most of them are not hireable. So hopefully one solves that problem and you get more supply. The numbers are still meaningful, but if you believe one and a half fantastic engineers, you got another guess coming. Hungary, the aspirational and reality gap is very large, so it produces enormous amount of both risk taking and drive. Uh, you must have read about this 996 thing in China. Uh, those of you, uh, this is work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. It's not that bad in India, but you see a lot of hunger uh, among a lot of the people who start companies. Uh, social norms have moved in favor of entrepreneurship, especially after parents read in the newspaper that somebody made a billion dollars, they tell their child, you should become an entrepreneur, as opposed to you must go get a government job which was the norm uh, even a decade and a half ago. I used to go to people's homes to reassure their parents that we will be in business. So please let your child work for my company. It's no longer the case. Um, cost of talent is lower. We've gone, we've gone through attitude and skilling. And not enough architects and managers. This is a very interesting dynamic, especially for those of you who think of opening offices in India. The traditional talent has been app development. Because services companies, there would be one architect who would drive a team of 50, 60, 70 developers. Those developers were basically told, do as you are told. And even if the chair is missing a leg, that's okay, we'll make more money. Because on the revision cycle for adding that check, uh, that chair leg, we will get more money. So there was not a premium for getting the product right. It was delivered on the basis of service. So you ended up with a lot of premium on becoming a manager, not on a senior technical contributor at an individual level. That trend has started reversing over the last five, six, seven years. So the natural time that it takes for people to become strong individual contributors is the gap that you see today. So if you start a high-end security company in India, you'll have two very good founders who understand the ins and outs of security. When you want to hire the next level, pardon my French, you're screwed. Then you start with a whole bunch of junior people or you get to three people. You can't build a critical mass of 20 high-quality people. That is changing but is not yet there. Is it fair? Okay, and by the way, this is not meant to either talk you in favor of or otherwise, this is a rendition of at least the way I see facts. Don't take them for, uh, or uh, don't take them too seriously. Market, it's a growth market in, across the board. Uh, 
we went through all of that. Uh, capital, one of the things working in favor of India is there is too much money in the world. And as long as people keep printing it, it needs a place to go to. And India is a very interesting destination, along with a whole bunch of others. So you will find a lot of money coming to India, in addition to a whole bunch of the other factors. That's worth calling out. Just a few comments on exits. Uh, actually, this also we've, we've gone through. Oh, this is one other interesting factor. I was looking at the number of unicorns. Unicorns defined as privately traded companies greater than a billion dollars in somebody's view. Uh, uh, somebody meaning somebody who wrote a check. So there are 125 in, uh, 125 in China, is it? Uh, So China, at least this Wikipedia page yeah, had 125. Yeah, be, be careful about counting. Yeah. OK. I see wide variation in the numbers. Uh, so please take all yeah. of these figures with a grain of salt. Absolutely. So the numbers that I got from a Wikipedia page were 25 in India, 100 in the US, and 125 in China. And then I started going through the ones in India. And I disagreed with at least five because I happen to know the companies. I'm an investor in one of them, and the company is bankrupt. So how it is being counted as a unicorn, I have no idea. Okay? <laughs> so clearly, the numbers are somewhat suspect. But as a, as a rough guess, uh, if one were to even take this it's factor of uh, potentially. Um, I think you're the last investment into the company. Gee, I think that uh, is right um, in terms of how people look at it. But even that pig can be dressed up. Uh, so. Roughly, the point that I was trying to get to, though, is not, as Professor Dasher said, to take those numbers too seriously, but to take the trend seriously. If you looked at how many large market cap companies existed in India even five years ago, it was probably a fifth of this. So if I were to summarize the whole thing, I view the whole country as a startup. Okay? And what are the characteristics of a startup? You bet on the first derivative, not on the absolute values. And for those of you who have forgotten, the first derivative is the growth, absolute value is the size. Uh, so it's not that it's a $2 trillion economy. It's you can build a business that can grow significantly faster than what you could do in a whole bunch of other places. So it's a startup bet. That is why you join a startup. IBM, you get fired for a 500K account in a startup you get carried on the shoulders of everybody for a 500k account. So that's the kind of dynamic that is there. So it becomes possible to raise money. It's also possible to lose a lot of money. Uh, actual do domestic dollars are small, venture industry, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, US players dominate. And the last one is uh, there are, it's like a barbell. There are companies that, if the fundraising skills are fantastic, you can justify losing money with the 10 year picture in mind which was what we were talking about. Because then you're showing everybody this picture. Winner will take all. Come with me. It requires fundraising skills. Operationally, you don't have to worry about it. Because whether you are losing 10% or 12%, who cares? It's fundraising games. And those people who are not able to raise funds that effectively, that is not a core competence. There are lots of much smaller opportunities out there. $100 million businesses galore. So at least the way I think of it is as this barbell, one pegged to raise and burn large amounts of cash, the other pegged to be OK with a smaller exit, but that will still do fairly well on a returns basis if one is disciplined. Okay. So end of the deck. Thank you very Thank much. You. So I do want to spend a little more time in Q&A, but I want to kind of ask the first one. Yes, sir. So uh, you had about 3 or $4 billion of funds raised in venture capital. Do you think that is about right for the amount of investing that there is, or do you think that it should be a lot more? Is, it, is there a real scarcity of venture capital, or is this really kind of too much money pushing too few yeah. deals? So I think there are uh, multiple ways of asking what is right. One is, are you getting the returns invested? Because, for example, in the US, uh, 75 percent of the venture funds return less than zero. So if you give 100 bucks to a venture fund, 75 percent of them will not give you a buck back. Okay? Yet a whole bunch of people make a lot of money in the US. 
So my sense is that I think in India, the amount of money that is there is actually less than what the country needs, largely because there is a huge hole in the mid stage of investing. So companies that want to raise Series B, Series C funds in India have an inordinately hard time. You can get early stage money because there is a fairly vibrant angel community. And by the time you are succeeding and growing very large, a whole bunch of foreign investors come in. You don't even rely on domestic capital. The likes of SoftBank, Tiger Global, there are a whole host of people who come in, which is not counted there, by the way. No. So it's this mid-level stuff that is, that is missing. And does that have to do with what happens to attitudes about investing in growth versus absolute size? Or what, why, why is it missing? So I think part of it is just the maturity cycle, okay. where to start writing those kinds of checks, you need people who have had some success writing smaller checks, and those people are growing up. That is one part of the dynamic. And I think the other one is tied to exits. People will be willing to create larger funds once they have seen money coming back, which is one of these yeah. timing cycles yeah. where you have to wait for eight, 10 years, and there will be some casualties. Right. Uh, on the delivering. So I think from a timing perspective, it's hard to get funds in all stages of capital right up Immediately, front. yeah. And right. therefore, it's a natural phasing out okay. in my view. Uh, there's one other area that I really want to address, and uh, partly because of our presentation a couple of weeks ago, and it's the rich and poor gap uh, among the, the general population, right? So are you seeing that as something that's getting worse, or is it improving? Uh, are the motivations for developing new companies, not B2B, but on the B2C side, yep. are they really looking at addressing basic needs or what? are they more technology driven now? Got you. So in my view, it is not improving as quickly as I would like, but I think all of us would like it to be better than whatever it is right now. Um, so that becomes a tautology at one level. But I do think even at fundamental levels, the growth in GDP is lower than what is needed to deal with. So for example, India has about 15 million people who come out of some kind of an educational system every year. Mm -hmm. Of that, about 11 to 12 do not have a job that engages them for the education that they received. And this is not a straightforward problem either here or there or anywhere to solve. Yeah. So I think it is growing slower than, than at least mm -hmm. what I would like. If you were to believe official numbers, they hover around 7 to 8%. If you were to compare it to China during the stage that they were getting out of this stage of poverty, one definitely needs double digit percentage growth. And here uh -huh. I'm just parroting. This is not because of a deep understanding. It's because of having read maybe one too many articles. There's a different answer to this <coughs> The large growing middle class is in fact a sign of the fact that that gap is narrowing <coughs> because the middle class is expanding to and creating its own marketplace. Now, whether the ratio of the incomes at the high end and the low end has increased is a different kind of measure of uh, disparity. But if you're looking at the, at the size of the market growing, it's all growing in the middle class. It's not growing at the top end. So that is one, and the other one I think is, you, you're going to find there is yet another class of companies which, as you pointed out, one class, there is one other class of companies that I consciously didn't address this time, which is the number of young people who are looking to make a difference is refreshingly large. And I'm really, really glad that uh, there are not more people like, uh, that there are many more people, unlike at least what my motivations were when I was their age. Uh, it, there is, I think we are in good social hands. Entrepreneurship. Uh, social entrepreneurs, people who are even in large companies but give large amounts of time. And uh, how do you apply technology to solve more fundamental problems? And it is not just uh, mm -hmm. getting impressed by two, three people. Yeah. These are significantly large number of people with good education. There are at least 10 alums from Stanford that I know who've finished their undergraduate degrees and have gone back and are working in stuff which is not going to make them wealthy. But they're at it. But very much helping society. Absolutely. And that's great. Let's open the floor. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, given that India is predominantly agricultural, right? Uh, um, what about agri-tech? Is that included in the logistics that you mentioned? Or? It was not included there. But there are a number of, uh, especially over the last three, four years, very, very interesting agri-tech companies that are coming about. and. Uh, a couple of them just raised money to the tune of $100 million each, which would indicate that 
there is serious excitement. Uh, one of our companies does something in agri-tech, and that also gets divided up, and my understanding is thin, so please take this uh, under advisement. A lot of it is going in the logistics part of, just because stuff gets produced, it gets wasted. So there is warehousing and logistics is a big part, which is where one of our companies is making significant investments and they're reaping rich benefits. This is the big basket, the company that provides, that delivers groceries to your house. They have vertically integrated back to the farm because they find that it makes a huge difference uh, to your unit economics. Uh, I don't know how many people are doing stuff around better water management or better seed management stuff. I just don't have an idea there. Uh, I have more visibility into the the logistics and warehousing piece. Thank you. Go ahead. <coughs> you mentioned that in India, the financial infrastructure, when you go back, you still see people using checks and a lot no, of... No, that was here. Oh, that was here. Yeah. So this is the Stone Age place on the fintech space as compared to India. Sorry, I wasn't clear. <laughs> We're still yeah. a cash society, right? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I saw your hand next. Currently, there is a strong focus on having uh, strong technical skills to like advance in your career or to uh, open a startup. Uh, but in India, apparently, from, from a lot of these startups, it seems like you need stronger business skills as opposed to <coughs> stronger technical skills. Uh, is that assumption right? Or uh, To be the founder or uh, help me with that? Because the answer is both, but that is too easy and trite an answer. So I want to understand a little more about what you had in mind. Yes, in a way, to... Uh, to be a founder or to be, ha I guess, to, to be a founder or to be earning a lot of money. Got it. So different answers to one and two, uh, meaning founder versus earning a lot of money. Uh, a founder might never earn any money. Uh, so it's not the best way to maximize gain uh, from a predictability perspective. So at least there I have a slightly different view. I think it depends upon the company. If you're starting a company targeting dev tools, Every founder better understand coding because the product definition starts from your customer as a developer. If you're starting a consumer internet company, somebody better understand go to market using mass media kinds of things, marketing. If you're starting an enterprise sales company, you better have a tech founder who can defend the nuts and bolts of what you are building and a sales oriented person who can make sure that you're building the right thing. So I think the answer is more contextual. Several of the problems, as you correctly pointed out, in India do not rely on deep tech if they're going after the domestic market. If they're going after the US market, all of this applies. If you're going after the domestic market, it is not a deep tech problem. So indeed, you are better served with having better product management, user interface, or business skills. You can get away with rubber band and chewing gum for much longer. If you are building a consumer product, people can get away with losing transactional data. They don't really care, as long as you're not selling them stuff. If you're talking about media, stuff like that, you can get away for a much longer distance. So indeed, that would apply for domestically focused companies given the stage of evolution. Once you get to scale, you better get those people in. Otherwise, just, just uh, you'll be run out of business. The successful enterprise behind Flipkart, Nokri.com, <coughs> they were all businessmen. No. OYO. No. Uh, unfortunately, that data doesn't take us anywhere. Both Sachin and Bini were developers at Amazon. Uh, Sanjeev Bhikchandani uh, used to teach at IIM Ahmedabad. Hitesh was an engineer turned, so there that data unfortunately is all over the map. So we can't, that points are hard to draw, curve through. Go ahead. He's the boss. Okay, okay so if there, is, if there is some uh, Indian company targeting the foreign market, let's say USA, <coughs> so from PC's uh, point of uh, standpoint, uh, PC's in the USA will be more interested in investing in Indian company or the VCs from the India Will be more interested in investing in Indian companies? It's, it's a great point, and I think it is also an opportunity, and I'll dig deeper into that. So if you look at somebody who's sitting here, this place has enough and more opportunity. So there is very little motivation for a VC here to go hunting in India. Okay? There is also a higher level building block. When you go out and raise money from people, so for example, when I raised money from, so Stanford is one of my investors, they would ask me, so, what are you going to do? And I tell them, oh, I'm going to go invest in Indian companies. They have a different person who will talk to me than the person who tells them, I'm going to sit in the valley. This is very important, by the way. Why am I saying this? Because the source of capital decides that they want to put 1% in emerging market, 5% in the valley, 
6% in buying wood, 20% I'm making sense. So for a person to wander off wherever there is opportunity, they get slapped by the people who gave them money because now they have muddled the charter that they had been entrusted with to begin with. Am I making sense? So there is that one fundamental dynamic that your boss tells you, stay in place, play center, not defense. Then there is a second question, which is the person here and the West Coast in particular is 12 and a half hours. It's designed to inflict pain if you want to work across India. Uh, they don't want to go hunt there because there is enough opportunity. What ends up happening is that companies get funded in India. <laughs> then when they want to come to attack the US market, that is when they come to US investors and tell them, look, I have some evidence that I can address this market. Now I would like to take your money. That is when this, the US investor steps in. Does that answer the question that you're raising? Yes. So, so I'll give you one more example. Is, let's say uh, somebody founder is in the USA, and then <coughs> they understand the US market very well and want to target the US market. But the company just started in India for economical reasons, right? So in that case, what is the trend you see? Uh, you know, in, in so, I can give you my definition of whether a company is a US company or an India company. And this is again a matter of eye of the beholder. My definition is where does the CEO sit? Uh, in USA. Then it's a US company. Then they could be developing code on the moon for all you care. Okay, Because then the people here will say we have comfort in the person who holds the bag. This person will therefore come here. And this clearly is a definition that can be debated. That is my definition. Wherever the CEO sits, that is where the, you will find most efficacy. Well, these are also transient, right? The CEOs will typically, again, they could, they would move typically where the market is. I Absolutely. Think, I would think is the definition of your focus. So your customer. let's debate that later because I don't think we'll close this answer, which is why I qualified it right up front that this is my definition and it's subject to debate. So, okay. You had a question. <coughs> Oh, okay. So I tell you what, I think we're getting close to the end of the time of the uh, session. We've got some refreshments outside, and, and I think there are a number of conversations to continue at this point. But first of all, please join me in thanking Ashish very much for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll clear the room and go out and have something to eat and drink.